Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Bethel Backstage. I am Dan Jacobson, joined with Steve DeWitt, Mark Colton, and Dexter Harris. We are uh, four of the five campus pastors here at Bethel. And happy Easter on behalf of all of us here. We want to say yes. thanks for tuning in uh, on such a special day. I got my Easter eggs here. And uh, Mark, I, I want to just get you yours. Don't worry, I sanitize these. You can. All right. Put those there. We can't get our senior pastors sick because no. we have, we need leadership here in this moment. But um, guys, this is one of the things that we res- we resonate Easter with, is Easter eggs. Now, as pastors, this is like one of the worst uh, things because our kids grow up thinking you know Easter's about jelly beans and the Easter egg. But this is a visual that I just need right now. Bright colored eggs in the midst of a depressing mm. season for me. My kids, we go out in the backyard, we have the neighborhood Easter egg hunt, and it's one of my favorite uh, Easter moments. And so I'm just curious, I want to know from you guys, uh, maybe Mark, what's one of your family's Easter traditions that you guys will be trying to figure out today? Well, I mean, the the thing that hit me right away, and somebody mentioned this, I think, on social media, was I can never remember a time in my entire life that we as a family haven't attended church together at the building. So, I mean, that's an obvious one, but... It, it, everything's different today. You know, it, we're worshiping together, but we're not tr- dressing up, going and doing the normal Easter things. And so it felt a little wrong at first, you know, but, um, but uh, Easter's still happening and uh, it's still exciting, but that is weird for me. I feel like I'm skipping church. Dexter, what's your family's tradition? We barbecue, man. We throw ribs on the grill, some grilled chicken. And uh, I think the only thing to figure out is uh, getting more people to – you usually have a bunch of people to help eat it, so i got to figure out what I'm going to do with the calories. You're keeping the quantity, so, but you're, you're exactly. decreasing the people. Exactly. So so i got to figure <laughs> that part out. It's going to be a lot of running after Easter. So. A lot of running. Steve, what, what does your family do? Well, you know, I, uh, I always am preaching a bunch of services. And, uh, you know, Good Friday, Saturday, Easter, Sunday, Easter, lots of people, and, and then I go home and crash – so that feels a little bit different. Uh, I'm, I'm also grieving that um, uh, the Masters Golf Tournament is not going to be able to be my <laughs> afternoon yes. uh, sort of enjoyment. That's off the table. Uh, but uh, the rest of it we can do, you know, with um, a nice meal with the family and uh, enjoying our daughters and, you know, hiding the eggs and that sort of thing. So, yeah. yeah so be- you mentioned at the beginning of your sermon today, about how is our this is our I love the title our pandemic Easter and it's so appropriate because we're in the midst of this season, um, but Easter itself is a uh, world shaking event an upside down world that Jesus ushers in for us it's it works on two different levels. And uh, I, I guess if you could just say a little bit more to our church family, we're still doing the online church thing. Um, this is a different scenario for us. But as you think about Easter in a pandemic, us not being together, uh, is there any encouragement that you could give us just in, in terms of that? Well, as I said in the message, I think that we will uh, we'll remember this Easter probably the rest of our lives. And we'll hope that it's the only time that we have to do it this way. Uh, But my encouragement would be that if viewing the Easter service today was one of, you know, 10 programs you're going to watch today, and there's there's nothing else that you bring into the home that makes uh, the content of today's service be really the the focus of the day, I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, So I would encourage you not to let the the content uh, of... Our, our services to somehow be lost in a day of sitting around looking at phones and, and, you know, watching the news. So whatever it would take in your home to make it very clear that this is the special thing, that's what I would do. Absolutely. Great word. Absolutely. You know, you, you mentioned in your sermon, I thought it was so great to cut through the clutter of what is typically a commercialized holiday. You know, a lot of people don't think about Easter in the terms of the actual historical resurrection of Jesus Christ. They think about it in terms of a excuse to barbecue. Sorry, Dex, but they think about it in terms of, of eggs and all these things. You, you very clearly set the tone for us today in your sermon, and I want to appreciate this, of saying that today is a day where God turned the world upside down. And I think that's what those kind of the words that you used for that. And I think um, for us to, to make sure that it's not just something that we're considering for a couple minutes, but that we could actually celebrate uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning for Easter as a pastor. And I missed 
being with our church family today in person, but how great it was to uh, think and to mull over your sermon. Uh, Mark, as we think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the world being turned upside down, um, what are some, some ways that we could celebrate that or let our hearts pause on that today with our families, even after the service has gone on? Yeah, you know, I, I think the world needs Easter now, needs the resurrection of Christ now more than ever. And so we as our families can can rejoice and the joy that people see in us will hopefully be a little a little silver lining right now. I mean, I, I look around and, and, and it's almost like death hangs in the air the way people are responding and they need to. We need to take precautions. We need to be safe and all that. People are thinking about life and death right now. And so I think for us as Christians, uh, we still are sober minded about that, but we have this deep joy that that should should be spilling out of our homes and hopefully the world sees life and uh, right now is a great opportunity to, to share the love of Jesus, even if it be from a distance, you know, to be able to rejoice, to sing. Uh, I've wondered if people can see us singing when they drive by our house. I don't know if they can see in there or not. I, I haven't figured that out. But do they see us rejoicing with joy, even though the world is a scary place sometimes? Yeah. Steve, you mentioned in your sermon a couple of, uh, we call, the, the word is apologetics. Right, and so this is, we want to raise the theological vernacular of our church here in uh, Bethel Backstage. It's one of our goals is to help people think a little bit more theologically. Uh, you you uh, gave a couple of apologetical arguments, and I'm thinking about the person who is watching at home, and maybe they just, they don't know anybody in our church, but for whatever reason, they were just led to click on the link and watch our service, and they heard your message. And they might be a little skeptical about, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Um, but you offered a couple of apologetic arguments, that is, you know, reasoned thoughts for why he did raise from the dead. Would you be willing to walk us through some of those? I'm um, thinking particularly of the fact that it was a new tomb borrowed from Joseph, that, those types of things. Well, there's, there's all kinds of little things in the story that help authenticate it. The biggest one in Matthew is the fact that uh, women are the first eyewitnesses. Yeah. You know, in that culture... Uh, and you know, we say sad about this, but this is just the reality that a woman's testimony would not be uh, permissible in court. And so if, if, if Matthew was trying to write um, a fake account of a resurrection, he would never have uh, women be the first ones at the tomb, first ones seeing Jesus. Um, and that, in a way, actually authenticates the fact that this is likely exactly what happened. Uh, and not to mention that uh, it certainly elevates uh, women in, um, in who Jesus uh, appeared to, and specifically Mary Magdalene, you know, the, the, the moment that she had with him uh, as well. Peter and John, they don't, uh, they don't meet him until the upper room. And uh, so that's one thing. You know, if you keep reading in Matthew, it goes on to say that the, the, the Pharisees offer the soldiers a great deal of money to spread the rumor that the disciples came and stole the body uh, while they were asleep. And uh, that also helps authenticate the story in that, obviously, how would they know who stole the body if they were asleep? So it's a self-defeating argument. But further, um, the, the way the Roman system worked amongst the soldiers, that, that kind of a dereliction of duty would be like a capital offense. Like, they, they would be they'd be in so much trouble and, and possibly even be killed for um, failing to fulfill their, their duty. Uh, so you have you know, little, a little tip like that that says, you know what, that actually, you know, the argument that, um, you know, that the disciples stole the body, that doesn't hold, uh, doesn't hold water either. So little things like that, little tips in, uh, in the story. You mentioned the one at the tomb that if, you know, the fact that it was an unused tomb, means that there was only one body that was in there, as opposed to maybe a family crypt where there was six or seven, and it was at six, was it seven, and now we're in here, and it looks like maybe the body that we thought, but the, you, could, you could leave room for confusion, but it was an unused tomb, and uh, you know Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and Matthew are the same ones who are there at his burial, so they're going back you know, to the very same Tomb. One of the arguments is they were confused which, you know, which tomb it was. 
Um, and of course, if that had been the case, then the, the religious leaders could have just brought Jesus' body out at any moment and completely undermined uh, Christianity, which they never did because they never could do that. And so it's like a, there's all these uh, spiraling uh, implications that you see just from the simple narrative of the story. Yeah. You, uh, you, you brought us in your message to talk about uh, wonder, the wonder that the women experienced there and the worship uh, I've heard it said from a, a very smart pastor before that beauty leads to wonder and wonder leads to worship. And anybody know who said that? <laughs> I'm going to go with Steve DeWitt. Steve DeWitt. That's a yeah. small plug for uh, Eyes Wide Open, yeah. which if you're in quarantine and need a book to read, please go pick that up. Uh, but very similar thought today of wonder leading to worship, worship leading to joy. And that's what the resurrection does for us. Dex, why is an empty tomb a cause for us to worship Jesus and to be filled with joy. What does an empty tomb do for us today? Yeah, I think that an empty tomb gives us a profound peace. And one of the reasons why it does that, as we consider our context even now with COVID-19, there's so many um, so-called vaccines or ways to be healed um, from this virus and to come out that these things are not even real, they're not even true. But going off of what Pastor Steve said, like all of these facts, and then concluding that there's an empty tomb, this now becomes real for me, right? Um, that, that, that there is a risen Jesus, that there is an empty tomb, that there is an answer, that there is hope, right? And so, and so what is the natural response of the human soul when the scary monster is now defeated? I'm rejoicing, right? I got yeah. peace now. I got joy that I never had before, right? Um, I can I can live life in a way that others cannot live life because they don't have that hope. Or even going back to uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when he got that golden ticket, right? He's running all over the place because he has access to something that everyone else does not have access to. And I think as believers, we now have access um, to this truth and this peace and this joy that we can now go spread around into the entire world uh, that is authentic and real because of an empty tomb. Can I dovetail just on something, Dexter, that was well said? You know, when you think about the, uh, the, the coronavirus and everyone's desire for a, a, a solution, how many people are praying right now to God, oh God, won't you please provide some, you know, medical breakthrough, something that will take care of this problem? You know, God's answer to coronavirus and heart disease and, and lung cancer and you know the thousand other things that we inevitably die from, it's the same answer. It is a resurrected, glorified body for all who trust and believe in Jesus. And if this one doesn't get us, one of these other things is going to get us. Uh, but that empty tomb is the, like, it's the, it's the vaccine for all of it, you know, and it covers all of the pestilences of the human experience. We look to the we look to the resurrection for it. Can we dig a little deeper in on that one thought? Because I, I I think when we talk about Easter and the resurrection, we understand the idea that Christ was dead, now he's alive. But could you give us a broad stroke of Good Friday and Easter together as what we call the gospel, right? The gospel truth. Could you help us understand what that accomplishes? The work of Christ in His death and His resurrection. What does it do for us? Not just theologically. We're talking about the practical implications. I want to go back just a, a layer into what does His death on the cross accomplish for us? What does His resurrection from the dead accomplish for us? Well, that's a very it's big a very question. Broad, broad question. We're going to try to tackle it in two minutes. But well. I think a summary would be that Jesus' death on the cross was uh, paying the ransom price for our sins. He propitiates, satisfies God's wrath. He um, uh, provides a way for us to have our sins forgiven uh, through his substitutionary atonement. All of that was, was Jesus dying. And if you separated the resurrection from the, the, the cross, you, you could, in a sense, have those things accomplished. But what the, by the death of the Son of God, his worth is infinitely covering all of our guilt. But what the resurrection does is it simultaneously authenticates all the claims that Jesus made. And it answers the huge big question that we have about life and death and destiny and what happens to me when I, when I die. So that Paul makes the argument in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to know what's coming, look at the body of Jesus. His, his body, it was a forerunner, it was a prototype of the same body and experience that we're going to have someday. And so 
Uh, many Christians, I think, have a, a wrong sort of over-spiritualized view of what eternity would be like. We think about it being in heaven and we're floating or whatever. And the Bible is very, like, earthy, uh, very new earthy. And we will live forever in a body similar to the one that we have right now, similar to the one that Jesus had, only without any of the things we don't like about our bodies. None of the decay, none of the, the aging, none of the death. Uh, so the resurrection um, accomplishes all that. It reassures us. If Jesus was still dead, how would we ever know if you know believing in Him does anything for us? I mean, it's just there's a thousand things that all at the same time. That's why the resurrection really is a thing that if if people want to undermine Christianity, they've got to they've got to undermine the resurrection. Sure. Right. You said it at the end of your um, sermon, and I think it's a great way for us to just conclude our time here together. You said, consider the inevitability of death and an eternity somewhere, and Jesus' words will sing in your heart, this is one of his promises, that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he be dead, yet shall he live. Friends, that's a resurrection promise for us here today uh, on Easter Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to Bethel Backstage. On behalf of Mark Colton, Dexter Harris, Steve DeWitt, I'm Dan Jacobson. Thanks for tuning in.